Uh, Gus, you're on. But it's good to have fellow Pittsburghers here. I grew up in Pittsburgh, and as they say, I came clean from Pittsburgh. <laughs> Some people might not understand, but you do. And, and I remember at one time, in, in communicants class, we had to learn the short of catechism growing up. And we were asked at first question, what's the chief end of humanity? And I don't know, but a, a friend of mine and I were, what, were 12, 13 years old, we're sitting there and we're saying that the chief end of man is to glorify God. And instead of saying, and enjoy him forever, we said, annoy him forever. <laughs> to which our teacher got us to go out of the room and wait, went into time out. And I'll never forget being put in time out in, in, in Sunday school. But I, that's one of the things I remember was <laughs> we're supposed to annoy the Lord forever. So I don't forget, I'm not here next Sunday. I'll be in Pittsburgh. And uh, Heather is going to uh, pick up the ball and um, talk about Saul's conversion. So let me uh, read to you the lesson that's before us. This is from uh, Acts chapter 8, verses 26 to 40. And I'm reading from the message. Later, God's angel spoke to Philip, saying, At noon today, I want you to walk over to the desolate road that leads from Jerusalem down to Gaza. Philip got up and went. He met an Ethiopian eunuch coming down the road. The eunuch had been on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem and was returning to Ethiopia, where he was minister in charge of all the finances of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. He was riding in a chariot and reading the prophet Isaiah. The spirit told Philip, climb into the chariot. Running up alongside, Philip heard the eunuch reading Isaiah and asked, do you understand what you're reading? The eunuch answered, how can I without some help? And invited Philip into the chariot with him. The passage the eunuch was reading was this. As a, sheep, as a sheep led to slaughter, and quiet as a lamb being sheared, he was silent, saying nothing. He was mocked and put down, never got a fair trial. But who, can, but who now can count his kin, since he's been taken from the earth? The eunuch said, tell me, who is the prophet talking about, himself or, or someone else? Philip grabbed his chance. Using this passage as his text, he preached Jesus to the eunuch. As they continued down the road, they came to a stream of water. The eunuch said, here's water. Why can't I be baptized? He ordered the chariot to stop. They both went down to the water and Philip baptized the eunuch on the spot. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of God suddenly took Philip off. And that was the last the eunuch saw of Philip. But he didn't mind. He had what he had come for and went on down the road as happy as he could be. Philip showed up in, Azo as in Azotus and continued north, preaching the message in all the villages along that route until he arrived at Caesarea. The word of the Lord. For now, let's begin with the safe assumption that the, as our uh, lesson tells us about, that the dr dr dramatis personae in today's lesson is not necessarily a person by the name of Philip, but rather uh, we need to realize that any attempt to determine who this Philip is might well lead to just sheer speculation. Instead, I believe the better pursuit of understanding what Luke wants us to understand here and what is before us is to identify the Holy Spirit as the dramatis personae. 
Dramatis personae refers to the main character or characters in a literary work. And according to Luke, the fingerprints of the Holy Spirit are all over this encounter between someone by the name of Philip and a court official from Ethiopia. Without the Holy Spirit and the subsequent intervention of particular angels along the way, the proclamation of the gospel would have been severely stunted. But due to the activity of the Holy Spirit, the news of Jesus Christ begins to claim a foothold both in birthing the church and reaching the far corners of the world, and especially, especially for the sake of those who might have been excluded from the benefits of the gospel. Now, as our lesson book helps us to understand, the Holy Spirit orchestrates not a blurring of boundaries, but an expansion of boundaries so those who were once considered out are now considered what? In. Luke's highlighting of the Spirit's inclusive activity causes us to conclude that the gospel has a home in both the wilderness as well as the courts of officialdom. Such highlighting causes us to realize that if there is someone whose unique race and sexuality as well as authority is now embraced by God, no doubt there are others out there for whom the gospel will also be appealing. Now you may recall from last week's text of the crippled beggar who was healed in the name of Jesus Christ, and I refer to that healing as a mini-resurrection. Just as Jesus was raised to new life, so was the crippled beggar raised to new life. Today's lesson, we may well observe a comparable mini-resurrection taking place. By way of baptism, the Ethiopian eunuch is raised to new life. A new life that Luke wants us to realize is far more profound than the eunuch's position of authority and even his sexual identity. What appears to be a prevailing significance is the eunuch's confession in verse 37 that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. With that confession, the eunuch identifies himself with the greater community of the kingdom of God. Like others who had already made, and like others who would, con who would come to make the same confession, the eunuch becomes, through that confession, a child of God, one for whom his place in life is determined not by some human standard, but by God's gracious claim and promise of new life, new and eternal life. Obviously, such new status becomes a source of great delight to the eunuch, for he continues on his way home with rejoicing, or as the message renders it, as happy as he could be. And let me point out that rejoicing is a favorite word of Luke's, and Luke often ties the word rejoicing with the finding of lost sheep, sons, and souls. That spirit of joy for what was once lost but which is now found points to God's intent that no one be excluded from God's bounty. What is of interest is the extent to which God goes to make divine graciousness known and available to humanity. Like uh, Rather, Luke makes us aware of how God accomplishes divine intent by way of Holy Spirit, activity that may baffle the modern reader, such as you and me, but for Luke is emblematic of how God's work is accomplished and accomplished with deliberation. Luke does not attempt to explain the mysterious, if not magical way, in which Philip is transported here and there. More important to Luke is that one person has heard the gospel and has responded in the affirmative. 
the agency of the Holy Spirit in such work, in such divine work, is not to be minimized or discounted. Not only is the Holy Spirit the designated comforter of the church, as we learn in John's Gospel, the Holy Spirit is also the great connector by which human status or achievement is no longer allowed to get in the way. Now, for me, the takeaways found in the account of the Ethiopian eunuch are twofold. <clears throat> First, there is the intentional activity of the Spirit to place the gospel before someone who is unique and decidedly different from those we have previously associated with the news of Jesus Christ. And second, divine activity through Holy Spirit is not confined to history, but is precisely the way God intends for the work of the church to be carried out. We know that. Luke tells us that. That's how the church came to be. And again, for Luke, the dramatis personae is Holy Spirit. Thus, what do we make of the mysterious ways by which the account of the Ethiopian eunuch is composed? Are we so baffled by Philip being instructed by an angel to engage in mission work that our perception of God's will at work is somehow compromised? Are we no less baffled by the way Philip is snatched from one locale and placed in another locale such that we somehow discredit all of God's unfolding intention for the life of one human being? And may we allow for such divine activity by accepting the ways God chooses to work, not just in human affairs, but also by believing that those that by believing that through those ways God is empowering the church for the sake of his ultimate mission and witness, which is to proclaim God's plan for peace on earth. And the only way that we will get peace on earth is if there is unity within the body of Christ, if not within the life of the world. For disciples, both modern day and ancient, such divine activity is worthy of our attention and our gratitude to God. For as Paul would one day tell us, God works all things together for what? Good. For good. And such working together is accomplished regardless of the preferential plans, choices, and desires we humans invent and in which we so often, if not too often, invest. So then, I think uh, that concludes my prepared remarks, but I think it's important that we realize that this passage from Luke's Gospel, um, and I continue to call this part of Luke's Gospel, this uh, Acts, is, has, has been troubling for folks for years, for centuries, because why? What's troubling in this in this lesson? The spirits of Philip? No. Not the proximity of Ethiopia. No. They thought that the eunuch was below Christianity or unacceptable or something. Well, I mean, we're talking PLU here, are we not? People like us. And the eunuch is someone who is not PLU. Who here is a eunuch? Anyone? Raise your hand? No. But in that day, the eunuch would have had certain boundaries that he had to travel in, and there were other boundaries that eunuch could not travel in. And so the spirit here, what the spirit's doing is creating an inclusive environment for that eunuch to abide in, to associate in. Mainly, what is the eunuch now going to be able to enjoy? a larger community of people by being part of uh, the church. So that confession is the hallmark of that eunuch's life. No longer is he going to be seen as a eunuch or as an Ethiopian. He's now going to be seen as what? A child of God. Yeah. 
Can, and so can we put those lenses on and see him as a child of God and not see him as other things that distract our attention? Which would be what? He's probably African. He's a eunuch. He's been deformed in some way for some purpose. But now his claim to fame is that he is simply what? A child of God. Tom? I was just going to make the point that you know, we you would assume, and this is probably more for our society than it would be then, that he was a black man because it was from Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. We see Ethiopia uh, one time before, if you remember, during Solomon's reign, and uh, the Queen of Sheba, right. I believe it was called, came to visit just to see, see, uh, <coughs> see what's going on. Yeah, kind of thing. right. Uh, but this uh, this guy, I'm not sure that we really take this in. Uh, he's Secretary of the Treasury, I believe. Right, right. And that's a pretty big, uh, pretty responsible job. Yeah. And our Bible, one Carol and I have, translates the chariot as a carriage. And I don't like that better because uh, that's... I assume he had a entourage. I would, oh, yeah. I would have had yeah. to have yeah. yeah. at least five yeah. people yeah. came, came right. with him, yeah. and some of whom were soldiers for his long protection. Yeah, this was a motorcade. And, uh, sure. they, uh, and of course, he'd come a distance from Africa to uh, Jerusalem, right. which is very workable, but not, not a quick right. as it would be today. But anyway, the, uh, I think those things you. Uh, make it a little bit different. He was not a poor guy. No. He certainly, uh, he may not have been wealthy, but he certainly but he had a certain poverty, and he must have known that. He must have realized he had a certain poverty. There was something lacking in his life, and which he decided to say, hey, I'm going to fill that with something. And, he, and the Spirit moves this fellow person to help him understand. And I think it's such an interesting comment um, where it says, you know, how, how can I understand this without some help? How do I understand Isaiah without someone helping me? My experience over the years has been there's so many folks who read into Scripture alone. And what they need is someone to help them understand what they're reading. In one sense, Scripture is accessible to read, but there are other parts of Scripture that you do need a guide. You need a commentary or a person or a professor or someone else, a pastor, who can show you and tell you what this really means. Because there are a lot of folks who are going to think it means this, but it means this. Lewis? Um, I think this is probably pretty common. It says he worked for the queen. Right. To work for the queen, you're probably going to have to be a eunuch. Oh, it would yeah. not allow the possibility of, of you having any kind of relationships with the queen. So just the fact that you chose to work for her meant that you had also agreed to be castrated. So that's, I think that's how that came about. Uh, the other part, I think there's a long history between Ethiopia and uh, and uh, uh, Judah or or, uh, uh, or Israel or however, whatever you want to call it, that goes back to the diaspora. Because even today, you know, there's a group in Ethiopia that claim that's where the Ark of the Covenant is mm -hmm. is located. And uh, they also have gone back and claimed Israeli citizenship in some cases. Uh, and it's been found from DNA that there there is a, a link. Uh -huh. Well, I think for our purposes and for what Luke wanted us to, to focus on is that, is that all the other attributes of this fella, this eunuch, fall away. The main point that Luke wants us to come away with when we think of the Ethiopian eunuch is that what? Um, he found Jesus. A brother in the life of the church. He made the confession that Jesus Christ is Lord. And in verse 37, if you have your Bibles open, you'll know that that's a variant reading that some um, 
Bibles don't include, some uh, manuscripts don't include, others do. And I would say that we, it would serve us well to include that in our reading, the verse 37, that that Ethiopian eunuch made the confession that Jesus Christ is Lord, he is risen. We, we cannot overlook that. And I think Luke wants us to understand that this person, his whole life, he's raised to new life. He's literally raised to new life spiritually, and now he's no longer to be thought of just as a eunuch or as a, and a, some official in some court or some, uh, some, uh, someone who's had some barbaric um, surgery done to him. He's now a child of God, and he stands with us in the community of faith. And too often, I think, you know, there are other things that detract from the fact that when you confess Christ as Lord, you become a new creation. And, they, and so the birth of the church is a new creation. He has become part of that, that new creation. Just building on what Lewis said about mm -hmm. Ethiopia, wasn't there a fairly significant Christian population in, in the early church in Ethiopia? Oh, I, I think the, the building on the Jewish uh, presence there, probably. The Ethiopian church is perhaps the oldest church right. on the face of the earth. And, and if you've been to Jerusalem, you, you're taken to there's a place there where the Ethiopian church has a location in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it's a, it goes back and, and they have, um, they, they think that the Ark of the Covenant is to be found somewhere in Ethiopia. Yeah. Is that, it's interesting through all of Paul's writing, the focus was on the Gentiles mm -hmm. beyond the Jewish establishment, uh, but we never hear any reference to non-Gentile Ethiopians in, in that outreach program. Yeah. Um, were, were they forgotten? I, I, I don't know. I don't know how Paul would have regarded the Ethiopian church at that time. But they were, I think, they were, they were emerging at the same time. So maybe throughout the era of cell phones and social media, Paul was unaware perhaps of how significantly they were taking root. I have a suspicion you say the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, Carol and I were on a tour that went there, yeah. and we went to that section. And one thing you were impressed real quickly was it was much poorer looking than the other three uh, uh -huh. um, yeah. parts of that. Yeah. And, and that sort of told me that there's a they've been fighting a stigma for a long time, possibly even the time yeah. that we show here. Yeah. that. They were accepted and they weren't accepted. Uh, there, there was a limit to it. Yeah. Um, well, what impresses me is that the confession that Christ is Lord cuts through all the all the barriers. Um, but you think about this guy had been to Jerusalem. Right. He had obviously talked to somebody that was uh, pretty knowledgeable about Scripture and and God. And he was reading. How? What was he reading? Was he reading one time? He was reading a scroll, probably. Yeah. And uh, that would tell you he's a, a little status there. But, but I'm thinking that a lot of times we have people visit this service, a, a service mm -hmm. here, and we all think about, well, they were a visitor. Did you speak? Yeah, I know I didn't. I was talking to so and so. Mm -hmm. And so many times. We miss an opportunity to what we in the Baptist Church used to call witnessing, uh -huh. and and Philip was witnessing to the Ethiopian here, whereas I don't know who had missed a chance in, when he was in the... Well, the Holy Spirit sends this Philip into the job market and, and gets this person oriented, yeah. And I find that to be... How the Spirit can speak to a lot of us and, and how yeah. we respond yeah, makes right. a difference. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I like, instead of yeah, being a Presbyterian, being part of that Frozen Chosen group, um, <laughs> I guess you know, we prefer to say uh, befriending instead of witnessing to someone. Yeah, that uh, during worship or during the so or whatever, you kind of befriend a visitor and say, you know, hello there and let them know that you're uh, wanting to express your greeting to them. Um, 
I like the expression, the failure to do a good deed is as reprehensible as the doing a bad deed. Yes, that's what put. Would the, would the scroll have been in Greek? Probably so. I would think so. Or, 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 or Hebrew. The education yes, of right. this man. Yeah. It may, I, I don't know that, Carolyn. It, it, that, that scroll of, of Isaiah could have been in Greek or probably was in Hebrew. If it were Hebrew, that would have been unusual for the, this man, wouldn't it, to read Hebrew? Well, back in those days, you, you were probably fluent in a couple languages because oh. of commerce. Yeah, to keep the ball rolling and the money coming in, you'd have to be able to communicate in, in the native language of these folks. Yeah. Well, sometimes when we read some of these stories, especially in this case, Philip, his identity is a little bit questionable. Yeah. He appears as one, one or two other places in the Bible, but we really don't know who, right. who he was. And he disappeared at the right. end of the story. That reminds me of Joseph, after all of his wonderful deeds in Egypt, yeah. he disappeared. We yeah. don't hear much more about Joseph and, and the retelling of our Bible stories. But, um, so you're raising in the question, if, if you focus on that mystery, you kind of miss the point yeah. that you helped us focus on, which right. is this Holy Spirit's at work. Let's not worry about the details yeah. to some extent. That makes me think of, of one of the quotes that came up from somebody in our Bible study several years ago, mm. when when a priest was asked about oh, how how can I believe the Bible? There's so many conflicting things in there. His response was, "Everything in the Bible is true, and some of it actually happened." <laughs> well, you know, we appropriate what's in Scripture through the eyes and heart of faith. And, and the historicity of it is important to some degree, but what we're asked to do is, do you believe? Do you believe this? And the answer is either yes or no. And some folks have a hard time believing it. Other folks don't have a hard time believing it. This fellow here, this Ethiopian eunuch, he's, he's accepting what he is being, what he's reading and what he's being told by Philip as a, as a companion here. And, and I see Philip here as being uh, a comforter, because in the Greek, the word for comforter is um, is one who comes alongside of you. And so Philip comes alongside of this eunuch, and he tells him this, and the eunuch accepts on faith that, that I, I want that. I want that. And he sees this water, and it isn't Philip who wants to add him to the church roster. It's the eunuch who says, here's some water. I can get baptized here. And I'm impressed by that. He knew he, that hunger, there was something missing in his life, and he realized how to fill that, that, that emptiness in his life by, uh, by being baptized, by be, becoming a child of God and being part of the community of faith. And as the message says, he went off as happy as he could be. When was, when was the last time we were as happy as we could be? Probably not as often as we should be. Or as, or as the, the, the father who goes off putting the 99 sheep behind him and looking for the one sheep that got lost. And, and Luke tells us he, he arrived rejoicing with the lamb over his shoulders. Well, I think so often... What scripture has, has, can do for us is it, there are so many names and places, uh, it can be confusing. And I think Luke, what Luke wants to do is, is to strip away some of these things. And how is this possible? Or how, how did that happen? And Luke basically is saying us, to, to us, trust in the Spirit of God to make all things work together for good even if that means annoying God forever. Well, let me pray for us. The Lord be with you. Well, oh, God, beyond all praising, we worship you today and sing the love amazing that songs cannot repay. 
for we can only wonder at every gift you send, at blessings without number and mercies without end. We lift our hearts before you and wait upon your word. We honor and adore you, our great and mighty Lord. Then hear, O oh gracious Savior, accept the love we bring. We who know your favor may serve you as our king. Whether our tomorrows be filled with good or ill, we'll triumph through our sorrows and rise to bless you still, to marvel at your beauty and glory in your ways and make a joyful duty our sacrifice of praise. Lord, accept our prayer and praise and know that we confess you now and always to be to us both in this life and in the life to come. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.